right, if you would just allow me to usher us into the Lord's presence this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today. We're just so grateful and so thankful for another opportunity to fellowship. We're thankful for the good health. We're thankful for the strength, the knowledge, the wisdom, the ability to continue to be impactful in our communities, Father God. Lord, we continue to bring forth to you our families back at home, our brothers and sisters in arms that are away from their families that are downrange. We ask for your spirit of protection upon them, your guidance, the spirit of discernment. We continue to bring forth our wing leadership, our group leadership, squadrons, and our airmen. We surrender at your feet, Father God, and we just know that our availability gives you the opportunity to move, Father God. Your word says where two or three are gathered that you will be present, Father God, and we're just so thankful. Now, as we go through our service today, we ask, Father God, that you arm the chaplain, that you arm the praise and worship team, that if there is a soul that is in need, that you provide peace, that you provide comfort, that you provide healing and restoration. Father God, we thank you. We worship you and we glorify your holy name. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. We worship you, O Lord. We come before you today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Good afternoon, JS fam. Today's responsive reading is going to be from the 47th Psalm, verses 6 through 9. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with the song. God reigns over the nations, God sits on his holy throne. Princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God, he is highly exalted. Thank you, amen. Um, we now invite you to hear a joyful noise unto the Lord. Life you hold to all he 
brings. Won't you listen to the angels sing? Glory, glory, glory to the newborn King. New life, new hope, to joy he brings. Won't you listen to the angels sing? Glory, glory. Cause he's intentional and never failing. All things are working for my good. He's intentional and never failing. All things are working for my good. Yes, they are. He's intentional. And never failing, never failing. All things are working, all things working for my good. He's intentional. He's intentional. And never failing, never failing. All things are working for my good. 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 Oh.
Hey, good afternoon, GS fam. Good to see your smiling faces here today. So if you don't mind, look in your bulletin. Uh, inside cover, there's a lot of discipleship opportunities, a lot of Bible studies you can get involved with. We want you to be involved. We want you to be part of our family here. Um, each of those listed Bible studies have a POC that you can get a hold of, usually through Facebook Messenger. In addition to that, there are service opportunities at the Titans Refuge. Um, we actually have volunteer training here. We are in, still in need of volunteers. If you have a heart to serve, um, that's one of our ways that we worship our God, right? So um, we need ushers, we need greeters, we need offering takers, we need singers. Um, if, if that's speaking to your heart, please, please stay after 10, 15 minutes. It's not long. Right after service, we're going to have training in the, in the back. In addition to that, um, as you probably realize, we switched our sneaker Sunday and fellowship Sundays this month. So today is our sneaker Sunday. Our fellowship Sunday is going to get switched to the third Sunday of the month. And then on the 24th of December at 1630, we're going to have a candlelight service here um, for the GS uh, service. All right, I'll hand it off over to Ramsey. Good afternoon, family. Oh, my God. Y'all can do a little better. Good afternoon, family. All right, we'll take it. We'll take it. All right, so it's offering time, everybody. Chef is excited. All right. It's offering time. This is the part of the service that everybody can participate in. We will be taking a physical offering, but there's also a QR code in the program if you would like to give online, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and pray. God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for being able to come into your house one more time. We just ask as we get ready to give this offering, God, let us give it with a cheerful heart and a great spirit, God. Let us go, let us know that it's going towards the building and expansion of your kingdom. And God, let's just give on behalf of those who cannot. We ask that you bless those who give a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand fold in Jesus' name, amen.
you, worship team. Give you guys a second. Well, GS fam, um, can you believe it that it is the first Sunday of the last month of 2020, y'all? <laughs> y'all, yeah, y'all, we have made it. We are still here. Let me tell you something. COVID-19 tried to take us out, right? Tried to take us down, but it couldn't stop us, and God still has his crown. Can we get an amen for that, right? Like, God still has his crown. Crowd, y'all, like I am so excited. Y'all are still sleepy or whatever. So this is what we'll do. Since we can't touch our pew neighbors, just tap in the middle, just tap them and say God is still on the throne. Just, just say God is still on the throne. Just wake them up. Just wake up. All right, so this will be our fifth week in the Gift of Grace series. And um, it's been two weeks since I've seen you guys, but I'm excited to jump into the Word. So what we're going to do is we're going to stand together. Um, Gonna go ahead and open up your Bible, scroll to Genesis 32. Yeah, the beginning. The beginning. I gotta open mine too. I thought I put my little saber in there. And if you don't have a Bible or an app, you can go ahead and look at the screen. And I was actually told to never do this, but I'm gonna read along with you guys from the screen. And the word of the Lord says, now he got up that same night and took his two wives, his two female slaves and his 11 children, and he crossed the shallow place of Jebok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and he sent across whatever he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he had not prevailed against Jacob, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, and the socket of his hip was dislocated. He wrestled with him. And then he said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have contended with God and men and have prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. Now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Penuel, and he was limping on his Hip. So if I had to tag this text, you guys could be seated. I would say it is called limp walking. Y'all, y'all did not mishear me. I did not put a P in front of that. I said limp walking. Today we are going to see how a limp, my God, something that was meant to discomfort us, dishearten us, maybe make us discontent and a perceived disadvantage as something that God could use to be our biggest blessing. And we will see this in the life of this man named Jacob, whose story actually began in Genesis 25. Now, before you guys start the mummering, particularly the people on, online, they may be thinking, it's Christmas season, why are we talking about Jesus? But if you follow along with me, you'll see how this all comes together, all right? So I'll explain to you guys that Jesus is in the Old Testament too. He shows up in several ways, but I'm going to talk about two particular ways here. He shows up in something called like experiences. So this is when people in the Bible would do things or function in a way that Jesus ultimately came and did and functioned in the New Testament. So for an example, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and he had the commandments, 
Well, Jesus fulfilled that, right? He came in the New Testament and said he did not come to abolish the law, abolish the law, excuse me, but to fulfill the law. So Jesus also talked more about explaining what the law was. So in Moses' day, an eye for an eye, where Jesus tells us to turn our cheek. That is one way of a, a like experience of somebody operating in a way that Jesus comes and operates in a bigger way. Another way is theoph theophany. I have a heavy tongue sometimes, so theophany. And this is a manifestation of God. So in the Bible, that is a tangible human sense. It's usually but not always a visible appearance of God in human form. So many theologians actually believe that the man that appeared to Joshua in 5, 13 to 15, he describes himself as the commander of the army of the Lord, that that was an example of a theophany. I believe that this passage that we just wrote, read with the wrestling is also an example of a theophany. Now keep this all in the back of your mind while we go in and meet Jacob. So let's talk about Jacob a little bit. So Jacob's father is Isaac. Isaac's father is Abraham. So we know them to be the fathers, the founding fathers of Judaism, but also the founding fathers of our faith because Jesus Christ comes through that lineage. So Isaac has a wife having difficulty uh, conceiving. He prays, he goes to the Lord, and God gives him two children. Now, it was a difficult pregnancy, right? He, she actually says, God, why is this happening to me? And the Lord answers to her and says, two nations are in your womb. Two people will come from you and be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will actually serve the younger. So he end up, she ended up having two healthy baby boys. She names the oldest Esau and names the youngest Jacob. Now Esau is born reddish. They're twins. A few moments earlier than Jacob. He also comes out hairy. And so they decided to name him Harry. Literally Harry. I wonder what my name would have been if my mom described me how I was born. And it, the creativity doesn't stop there, or the lack of creativity doesn't stop there. Because Jacob was holding Harry's heel, they called him the heel. That is the root word of Jacob's name in Hebrew, the, literally the heel. People translate it to the supplanter, which can also be translated as the availer, which also then ends up being translated as the deceiver. That's where we get that word. And there's a play on the Hebrew construct of how they describe um, deceiving, but we won't go into that. You can take that off, because I see some eyes going up there. I don't want them looking up there. And so we get to a point where Jacob is... God begins to describe the two and contrasting. So Esau is loved by his father. Esau is what we may consider in society a manly man. He liked to hunt. He was outdoorsy. He probably always smelled when he came in the house. But Jacob was more akin to doing the things that his mother liked to do. There's evidence that he was probably a mama's boy, that he cooked, and that was his, his theme. So we see that contrast, but the biggest contrast that we see throughout the conversation between the two is them highlighting that even though they were twins, Esau is the oldest. So I'm going to take you to a story, chapter 27, verses 32-33, and this is where we kind of really get the full picture of them. So I'm going to summarize. I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to summarize. So Jacob is in the kitchen cooking up some nice, we're going to say beef stew. Probably not beef stew, but we're just going to say beef stew for this context, right? And Esau returns extremely exhausted from a long day of hunting game. And he smells this aroma. Oh, my goodness. 
and he's so exhausted, he says, brother, feed me. Again, I am imagining this, right? And Jacob says, not until you give me your birthright. Now, anybody, even if you don't know what a birthright is, that does not sound like a fair trade-off, right? Or a smart move. But see, the birthright was a special honor that was given to the firstborn. It included a double portion of the family's heritage, along with one day being the, uh, being the, the leader of that family. It was a social status, but it also was a spiritual inheritance. So when a father would bless his oldest son, he was actually transferring every promise that God made to him and giving it to that older son. So see, Jacob understood exactly what traditionally Esau was supposed to have. And so he manipulated his brother when he was in a vulnerable place. So the scripture goes on to say, Esau says to him, Listen, I'm about to die, which he wasn't, but what good is my birthright right now? Esau responded in a, a desperate place. He reacted on some impulses, and he was willing to throw away a lasting benefit for an immediate pleasure. How many of you know, I'm not going to ask y'all to tell y'all business, so how many of you know somebody else that when they were tired, when they were exhausted, when they were fatigued, and maybe even a little frustrated, they begin to lower their standards? It didn't look what, they didn't see their promise come into fruition. So instead of keeping the standard that God or the gift that God had for them, they began to lower their standards. So I'll give you guys a, a quick story. I do not like running, probably not a surprise. And so many moons ago, when I was in basic combat training, we would do these company runs like once a week. It, it was ridiculous, right? But my drill sergeant was a former Marine, and so he would always say, relaxing Jackson, my behind, right? Like he was trying to prove a point. Well, I was probably in the second best shape of my life at that point, so I could do it. But after two miles, in my mind, I knew we had one more to go. And so I started to get fatigued and exhausted. And now because I knew I could breathe because I was still moving and we're saying it cadences, right? Well, I'm humming, I'm not saying it anymore by this point. I start to lose my form. Now, we all know how important the stride, breathing, and proper form is if we're going to run long distance. So because I began to compromise my form, I was looking and thinking for any reason to fall back. There was something that we had to keep, we had to keep water in our canteens at all times. And we were told to fill up our canteens from the water buffalo before night. I don't know why they wanted us to drink tap water, right? Or warm water. But sometimes you didn't do it. And so you would have to pour the water from out of the faucet because they checked it the first, first um, every morning when we would form up. So at that point, I was still a little bougie, but at that point when I felt like I was going to fall out, all I could think of was even faucet water. It was good in the middle of the summer in South Carolina. Can anybody in here relate to when you get exhausted and when you get hungry and when you get thirsty, you'll potentially drink anything. What I'm saying is, young man, young woman, old man, old woman, do not compromise what already belongs to you for a quick fix or a temporary pleasure pleasing moment. So we're going to fast forward 
And we now see that he actually deceives his brother because his brother was exhausted. But he had to now deceive his father. Now, what I would say is interesting is when the Lord is talking to Rebecca, he, she, he already says that the older will serve the younger. But probably because of tradition, he felt like Esau is still going to get the blessing, right? So Rebecca actually hears uh, Isaac tell Esau, I'm getting ready to pass away. I can't see right now. Go out. I want to bless you. But first, bring me a meal. So he gets ready to do that. Rebecca then tells uh, her son, Jacob, listen, they're about to bless him. I need you to go in and I need you to get this blessing. Again, I am paraphrasing. This is Chapel Hughes paraphrase to get to the point. So he does that, puts some hairy stuff on him like animal uh, hair, and he goes in with the meal and basically he deceives his father as well. It was his mother's plan. I'll tell you guys, I'll just put a pin here. Unfortunately, he never got to see his mother again. His mother passed away before he ever returned home. So sometimes that deception or maybe those character flaws we have, sometimes it's not our fault. Sometimes that is a, a curse of generational things. Remember Abraham, his grandfather? His grandfather lied to save his own life and said that Sarah was his sister and not his wife. His dad did the exact same thing. Isaac did the exact same thing with Rebecca. So now we just see this deceiving spirit carry on through the different diff uh, generations. So, rightfully so, Esau gets mad because the off, the inheritance is extremely important. And he says, I'm going to kill my brother. Now, we don't know if he's literal, but he probably was back then. And so Rebecca says, hey, you got to get out of here. So he, she sends her son away to her brother, Laban. And this is where she, he's, he meets Rachel, his soon-to-be wife. But Laban had two daughters. Laban's daughter, Rachel and his other daughter, Leah. The Bible actually says that Rachel was beautiful for me and pleasant on the eye and describes Leah <laughs> as having weak eyes. That didn't mean that Leah was cross-eyed or wore glasses. <laughs> that means Leah was ugly, y'all. And I'm tripping because I'm like, God, <laughs> you created it. This is your word. And you call that woman ugly. But that's how the Bible describes her. Again, a contrast. So he wants to marry Rachel almost immediately. But he also needs somewhere to work. And so Laban says, hey, you are my family. What can I do for you? He says, if you give me Rachel, I'll work for you seven years. He says, okay. Ladies, seven years, seven whole years, this man said, I'd work for her hand in marriage. Now, I'm not telling you guys that <laughs> you got to wait seven years for anything. But what I am saying is he was willing to work for her. He loved her. I'm also telling you that it doesn't matter the time limit, right? He immediately said that he loved her, but he was willing to wait. But see, she was the youngest, and it's not the custom of that tradition to marry off the youngest first. So what happens is after that seventh year, one day, man, Jacob's excited. I'm about to get my wife. They didn't have the ceremony like we had. It was consummation time, right? He goes to be with his wife, and he finds out that's not his wife. He wakes up the next day, and it is Leah. Again, deception. Here's another pin. <laughs> There's a lot of pins. Like, God just had me laughing during this whole thing, right? There's another pin. I think you need to take your time, and you need to make sure that before you get close to someone, 
before you lay down with someone, but I mean in the getting to know someone, you, you really got to get to know them because you might think you're laying down with Rachel and you wake up with Leah. Beautiful on the outside, but ugly on the inside. But that was Laban as a good dad saying, I just can't marry off my oldest child. I can't marry off my youngest child before my oldest. But it still was deception. So obviously, he says, hey, I'll work another seven years. That's 14 years working for this man so that he could be with Rachel. So he becomes healthy. He has children with his two wives and different concubines, and they have what we know as the 12 tribes of Israel. It is, that is the promise that God actually spoke to Abraham. He worked for 20, 20 years, so for a total of 20 years, and he becomes wealthy. And he, during that time, he begins deceive, to deceive Laban as well. So it's just a whole bunch of deception going on. So Laban says the same thing, I want to kill you as well. So he run, he's running from his life. But God had a conversation with Laban to not harm him. So he meets him, and they make this covenant for them to not to enter into each other's land. But once that reconciliation happens, God has already told Isaac to, excuse me, uh, Jacob to go home. But he remembered that he had an angry brother waiting for him. So this, this wealthy man begins to try to devise another plan to ensure that he lives. Now, if you look at chapter 32 earlier in that chapter, we see that Jacob sends a messenger with oxen and donkeys and flocks. This is him trying to buy himself out of death to gain favor with Esau. However, the messenger returns home, returns to Jacob and says, hey, I told your brother that you were coming and he is on his way to meet you. And he's also bringing 400 men. Sometimes God will, will not let you move into your future until you deal with your past. So according and respectfully so, Jacob is afraid. So he begins to divide all the riches in his family and his flock up. Because if, if his brother is going to come to take his life, he doesn't want to lose everything at one point, right? He's trying to minimize his losses. But he also takes the time to pray to the Lord and to ask God to rescue him out of his hands. So after he prays, he still is still dividing up uh, plans, right? Sending more gifts. And then that's what leads us to the text where it says they cross the river Ajiba. What I found so interesting about that is God just told me to go deeper. And the Hebrew of that name of that word is derived from a root word calling to empty itself. So before we can lip walk, before we can receive any type of blessing from the Lord, there is a posture. We have to choose to empty ourselves. Now the scripture doesn't say that he knew he was about to encounter God later on in the uh, verses, but it does show how desperate he got to save his own life. And he sent all that he had just hoping that it would satisfy Esau and would spare his life. And this is where we actually see our first kind of bit of fence of lip walking. Verse 24 says that Jacob was left alone. It doesn't say that he wasn't afraid anymore, but he was left alone after his children and his wives left. And then the Lord wrestled with him until daybreak. So we see God, or I would even argue, a foreshadowing of Jesus, which I do believe is a Christophany, initiating this time to wrestle with Jacob. So there's just sometimes in our walk with the Lord, he will actually show his love and his tenderness, and he will initiate time with us. And I don't see this wrestling as some match that God is having with the equal contender. I actually see it as an intimate moment. We all believe that God is omnipresent. That means he's everywhere at one time. But sometimes, whether in a worship uh, congregation, 
or in your home or in the car by yourself, God allows us to actually feel his presence. Verse 25, then goes on to say that when he saw this man, he could not defeat him. And he struck Jacob's hip socket as they wrestled and dislocated. See, we all know the WWF and WWE was fake, but your wrestle with God isn't. When you're wrestling with God, it is a tedious thing. It can, come, it can sometimes make you cry tears you didn't know you had in your soul. It will sometimes have you in your closet or on your knees for an hour because you're displeased with some sort of outcome. But the wrestling with the Lord is not to show and highlight your knowledge and your capabilities or even your monetary success. I believe that it exposes how much we actually need him. You, I, Jacob, no match for God. But my picture, right, I tell you guys when I read things, I see visuals. The visual I see is or saw was Jacob sweating, grunting, frustrated, because at this point, he doesn't even know who this man is. We know because we've read the story, but he doesn't know who this man is as he's about to enter and potentially lose his life when he meets his brother. But this man is gracious and doesn't spite him, smite him, which he could have, but he does remind him and humble him with a gentle touch on that hip socket. And what I find remarkable is that Jacob doesn't tap out. He doesn't hit that back. He actually clings on for dear life. That's what verse 26 says. Then he said to Jacob, let me go for its daybreak. And Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. It says he struck Jacob's hip socket as they wrestled. For those who have children, maybe this analogy will, will resonate on how much he clings to this unnamed man at that point. So you take your baby to go get shot. Early on, I was around my, uh, my nephew a lot when he was a kid. And so even at a young age, they can tell when they're about to go into the doctor's office, right? white coat or something, or other kids. And so they're antsy and they're moving around and when you take them back there to get the vaccines or the shots or whatever they need, before that doctor says anything, they're crying, <laughs> they're wrestling, they're agitated, right? Goes in, tries to give them lollipop, they still not happy. And then there's a moment where you're holding your child, or in my case, my nephew, you're holding them, and they're still crying, and they're still agitated, but they look up at you in their eyes, and they let you hold them a little tighter as the doctor gets ready to grab that big piece in their thigh. And they're still a little scared, but because you are right there with them, because they feel your arms, because they can actually see you in their eyes for a moment. There's peace, but they're still clinging on to you very tight. And they're scared, and it still hurts. And afterwards, they're crying, they probably think that you just, <laughs> you betrayed them, right? But that is how I saw Jacob clinging to the Lord or to this unnamed man as he was wrestling for his blessing. So then he says, what is your name? And he says, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have 
contended with God and with men and have prevailed. If anything, if you don't get anything from this service, that encounter with God, that wrestling with God, that potentially limp walking with God can give you an opportunity where he decides to change your name. So Jacob, the heel, supplanter, deceiver, trickster, liar, these are all synonyms that we have heard to describe him. God says, that's not you anymore. Israel, a prince. Israel, we know, that is a nation. So I know what you're used to responding to. I know how you used to walk. I know how you used to talk, but guess what? Your name is Israel. You won't ever answer to liar, deceiver, or Jacob anymore because that's no longer you. And to prove it, I'm going to let everybody else see. Now, it ain't going to be glorious, <laughs> but I'm going to give you a little limp. So everybody's going to know that you encountered me. You got to depend on me. You older now. You won't need to deceive anybody anymore because you had time with me. So then Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him right there. He still does not know at this point who he's wrestling with. But God decides to bless him in that moment. But here's the thing. This is why I argue that this is a Christophany. Because when we read a lot of stories about God of the Old Testament, right, we do see him being gracious, but he is a just God. You touch something, if you're, some, if you're not a priest and you touch anything that's sacred, you immediately die. Like God was not playing, all right? But when we see him manifest in the form of man, in the form of Jesus Christ, we see a little more patient God. We see an understanding God. We actually have proof that he comes off of his throne and he comes and he looks you in the eye. When you're accused of committing adultery, he gets in the sand with you and writes a little love letter to you. So the reason why I'm arguing that this is a foreshadow or this is a, a evidence of Jesus before incarnated is because he's touching him. The Bible tells us that no man can live and see God, but he's seeing God in the man form. So he's touching him. He's holding him. He's eye to eye, and he's still blessed, and he still lives. So now Israel has a revelation that this must be God that I'm dealing with. I don't know if any of you all ever had this moment where you're like, I am only still here because it's God. I know that if it wasn't God, I'm supposed to be gone. And again, I'm going back to I walk different. I talk different. I look different. But that's only because of God. Because if it was me, I would have still been using my same techniques, my deceiving techniques, or whatever techniques you personally deal with to get my way. But I can't anymore. Because I experienced the true living God. And he actually says, that I've seen God face to face, and yet my life has been preserved. What's the significance of a name? I told some leaders last week that words matter. Not just how you say it, but the actual words that come out of your mouth. So if I hear that I'm never going to be, or I'm just like X, Y, and Z, 
no matter how much I do on my own right, I still might go back to doing all of those things that was already placed inside of me when I was younger. But see, what God did for Israel, Jesus has done for every believer, is doing for anyone who decides to come to him. The word tells us that any man being Christ is a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, all things are new. I had some names back in the day, but now I like to go by Lauren. You had some names back in the day, and maybe sometimes people want to call you by those old names, but you got to remind them, I'm not that anymore because I got to live in my walk. Because I've been touched by the almighty God. Because I've been called. And Jesus, hey, I'm not perfect, but Jesus is definitely um, molding me and sanctifying me. And I can only walk different because of him. I can't promise you that this will be easy walking with a limp. And if you've been a believer for a while, you know that to be true. But I promise you it will be worth it. Jesus Christ came through his lineage. Forever we hear God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I think what's so key is even though God called him Israel and changed his name, it's a reminder that God is the father of sinners. He still loves you. It's a reminder that although you're new, he loved you when you weren't. So like we always do, can everybody bow your heads and close your eyes? If there is someone in here who does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, who does not know what it means to be called something differently by their father, and they want to walk differently, just put your finger in the air. And as a family, we will pray with you to come to know what we know as our Lord and Savior. Amen. Now, if there is anybody here that's like, ah, oh, I'm walking with a limp, but I sure want to straighten it out. I sure want to be perfect. I want to go back. And they're having a difficult time being different, being set apart. Place your finger in the air and we'll pray with you. Amen. Now as a family, we're gonna pray for our brothers and sisters together. Dear God, we see your precious sons and daughters. And you never told us that walking with you would be easy, Lord. But it's your grace. It is only by but your grace that we can carry on. So I pray for your sons and daughters that, who are having a little difficult time maintaining that limp because they're afraid of what other people may think, because they don't know how to navigate this walk in, with their current life. 
I pray that you bring men and women into their life to help them, to be a shoulder. I pray that you remind them that it is not about perfection, but progressing and to just keep moving so that they can place all of their burdens upon you. God, I thank you that we all are brothers and sisters in Christ. So we can encourage and we can challenge. And as we are in this season of thanking you for your precious son, we are reminded of those who are in less fortunate situations that we are in. God, we pray that you wrap your arms around them, that you prick some of our hearts and other people's hearts who are in good positions, Lord, to, to support and to give, God. And ultimately, we will trust you. You've been with us since we were born, and you're still with us today. You will never leave or forsake us, God. And so we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, all hearts, minds cleared. You already know if one day y'all going to ask me a question. No? All right. All right, let's stand to our feet and be dismissed. Just a reminder that our uh, volunteer... We're gonna have volunteer training in the back. I know a few of you guys already said that y'all coming, so I can't wait to see you get your get your hands working. Yes, Lord. So, all right, y'all want to be dismissed today? Y'all ready to go home, eat, take a nap, go to volunteer training? <laughs> Nothing fancy. God bless you all. I pray that you make the relationships that you need while you're here. I pray you get connected. I'm constantly praying that the Lord removes me and increases himself. So when you leave from this building, you will never leave from his presence. Go forth and be um, fulfilled and do and be the light and the salt that this world needs. Amen.